Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. Today's program is part five in the Corona Crisis series. The way it's going, this series may at least be a 10-part series. A friend of mine said to me the other day, the coronavirus crisis will end when the media says it will end. Now, obviously, the media didn't create this crisis, but we get the point. The media has the power to make the coronavirus outbreak the end of the world or to make it just like a very bad flu season, uh, all depending on how they want to report it. The lesson is don't go to the media for a balanced, right perspective on this disease. If you uh, watch your TV all day long, you probably think that this is the apocalypse. But if you don't watch the news, you probably think, well, life is just the same as normal, except you can't go shopping, can't go to work, can't go to the church because of government shutdowns. Well, anyway, I have a lot to uh, talk about today. Uh, I guess a good subtitle for today's program would be A Pandemic of Fear, Ignorance, and Authoritarianism. See, along with this virus comes all sorts of symptoms. And I'm not talking about coughs or fevers. A symptom of this disease is that it brings to the surface certain attitudes, certain core beliefs about this world that a person might have. A crisis doesn't make you. It only shows what you already are. If you have a certain worldview, let's say you're a globalist, or you believe in man-made global warming, or you're a socialist, when a crisis comes along, you will interpret the cause of that crisis, the cure for that crisis, through your worldview. Like the Pharisees. With their faulty worldview, they saw Jesus as Israel's problem, not as Israel's solution. They believed that people following Jesus would be a disaster, so the high priest said Jesus must be put to death. Otherwise, the Roman occupation will get worse. The Romans will come and take away our homes and our nation. John chapter 11. The interpretation or the reaction of Jesus' presence was according to their faulty worldview or their faulty theology about God and man and sin and redemption. It's the old hammer and the nail analogy. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If all you have is socialism, every problem is caused by economic disparities and the solution is economic collectivism. If all you have is global warming, every problem is caused by CO2 and the solution is the Green New Deal. Like the Pope said last week, the coronavirus is nature's response to man-made global warming, and therefore we need to take decisive steps. Or how about a Democrat Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, claiming that the coronavirus is caused by environmental racism? In other words, because people are racist, that's why there are poor communities where there is poor sanitation, where the virus can spread, uh, she says this because she sees everything through the lens of racism. And all of these news stories that we're hearing that we should not call the coronavirus the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus, it's all coming from those who see racism in everything. Even though every other virus has been named after its source, Ebola Africa, MERS, the Middle East, Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, the Hong Kong flu, the Spanish flu, the German measles. But now that is seen as racist by those who see the world through racist colored glasses. Uh, did you notice all the articles last week claiming that the Corona virus here in America was a strain that came from Europe? Because apparently America got the strain, the same strain as Europe got. So hence the virus is now alleged to have been spread in America by the Europeans, not by the Chinese. I hope you see the fallacy in the science and logic in this claim. 
it's more likely that China spread the same strain to Europe and to America. But this narrative is being pushed to defend China. And I wouldn't be surprised if the story had its origin and its funding in China. Here's an article in Time magazine, Five Lessons from Coronavirus That Will Help Us Tackle Ch Climate Change. And the article is all about how to use the virus crisis to advance the climate change agenda and the Green New Deal. Here's an article in the Washington Post. Homeschooling during coronavirus will set back a generation. So while some social leaders and parents are saying how great it is that parents can now get involved in their children's education rather than it being solely the job of the state, those on the left who feel threatened by homeschooling, who want the state to indoctrinate the children, are using the current crisis as an opportunity to criticize homeschooling. Homeschooling contradicts their worldview concerning the family and the state. Then there was Catherine Stewart's editorial in the New York Times. The religious rights hostility to science is crippling our coronavirus response. So for this woman, Christianity is making the coronavirus pandemic worse because in her mind, Christians are anti-science. And so she connects the dots in such a way that the Christians are to blame. So again, the crisis brings to the surface one's worldview. Joe Biden said last week, no one should need to pay for coronavirus treatment. Why does he say this? Because this is his worldview, that people should not have to pay for their own health care. Others should pay for you because Biden is a socialist and he leans more towards social responsibility than individual responsibility. Is he right? Is he wrong? What does the Bible say? Well, that's a whole other discussion. But notice again that the pandemic is bringing to the surface people's worldview. People react according to their worldview. And the worldview of politicians matter because of what they may do in a crisis. What would Bernie Sanders be doing now if he's the president of the United States? I shudder to think. The other week, Senator Schumer sent a letter to President Trump complaining that there shouldn't be a patchwork of responses to the virus by the individual states. But there needs to be one approach dictated from the top down by the federal government. Schumer even said in his letter, we should not rely on voluntary efforts. Well, he says this because he's a big government status. He immediately thinks in terms of federal control, that the federal uh, government, that federal control will be better than individual states deciding for themselves. He sees power from the top as a better solution. I'm glad he's not the president. Then there's Nancy Pelosi's reaction. She has started a committee in the House to look into President Trump's and his administration's response to the coronavirus, just like she started a committee to look into the alleged collusion between Trump and Russia. And she started a committee to look into Trump's phone call with the Ukrainian president. The headlines from Trump and conservative media is, here we go again. These Democrats want to find an impeachable offense in Trump's response to the virus. Because in Pelosi's worldview, COVID-19 is just another opportunity to make the president look bad, to increase the prospects of a Democratic victory in November. In a Democratic conference call, Pelosi said that the president's delay to deal with the coronavirus was almost sinful, unquote. Yet remember, Nancy Pelosi in February was downplaying the seriousness of the virus. She went to Chinatown in San Francisco. She encouraged public gatherings and she criticized the president for the travel ban on China. She made it all about racism. But her leftist worldview blinds her to her hypocrisy. The media is also using this crisis to advance their war on the Republican administration. The media is playing the gotcha game, trying to put a racist spin on whatever the administration is saying or doing. 
uh, trying to fix blame in the administration for not acting soon enough, even though it was the media outlets that were downplaying the crisis in February and early March, as Trump demonstrated in some video clips of the media in his Monday night uh, news briefing. Uh, one conservative commentator I heard explained it very well this way. Remember when FDR said about the Great Depression, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. If the media treated FDR the way the media is now treating Trump, they would have reported that FDR's statement was insensitive and intolerant and ignorant. I mean, what do you mean the only thing we have to fear is, is fear? I mean, people are losing their jobs. People are hungry. Uh, the, the, the president is downplaying the severity of the crisis. But no, the media was behind FDR. So what he, was, so what he said was interpreted as being reassuring. But notice how the media acts today. If they like the political party of the politician, everything he says is spun as good. If they don't like the political party of the politician, everything he says is spun as bad. Case in point, President Trump said in a news briefing that death is our enemy, which is actually a biblical statement. But then Chris Cuomo at CNN went off in a long tirade criticizing uh, that comment from the president saying, enemy is not the death. The enemy is disinformation, inaction, lies, division. It's just, just amazing that people's animus toward the president is causing them to say so many foolish things without them even being aware of how foolish they're being. So this is being called TDS. TDS is just another symptom of the coronavirus. TDS stands for Trump Derangement syndrome. Here's another example of the coronavirus seen through one's worldview. The governor of California, Newsom, in a news conference said something very telling. He said, in effect, we need to look at this pandemic through the equity lens. There is opportunity for reimagining a more progressive era as it relates to capitalism. So yes, absolutely, we see this as an opportunity to reshape the way we do business and how we govern. In other words, Newsom sees the pandemic as a, another means of moving from capitalism to more socialism. And in the same article in the Washington Examiner, Democratic Congressman James Clyburn said, the coronavirus relief package is a tremendous opportunity to restructure things to fit our vision. So these are just some examples of how people's political ideology is brought to the surface in a crisis. The coronavirus is being seen through the lens of racism, through the lens of climate change, through the lens of Trump derangement syndrome or socialism. Each of these Ideological responses could be made into an entire God and country program. But the point is that the people of the world, in their spiritual blindness, wrongly understand the crisis. And they, they misunderstand the causes, uh, the, the results, the cure. They don't interpret the problem correctly or see the right solution. And we often read about this in the Old Testament when a crisis would come upon ancient Israel. Most often the leadership, the wise men, the kings, the elders, didn't handle it according to the word of the Lord, but according to their own opinions and feelings. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. Those who guide you lead you astray and confuse the direction of your path. Or Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 9. The wise men are put to shame. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they've rejected the word of the Lord. What kind of wisdom do they have? So in a time of crisis, foolish leaders are everywhere. And in the coming apocalypse, do you think the nations will see that crisis through the proper lens, through the proper worldview? Well, of course not. They are going to respond wrongly. Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. The rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as to not worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, 
which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immoralities, nor of their thefts. So rather than the apocalypse correcting these people's false ideologies and their worldview, they doubled down on their paganism. Also, Revelation 16, 9, men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Uh, Revelation 16, 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So that is the ultimate example of how a satanic worldview results in a wrong reaction to a crisis. Where crisis doesn't drive people to God in truth, if a people are spiritually lost, a crisis will drive them further from God. They will double down on their fantasies. And in a crisis, they will fight to maintain their false values and their worldview at all costs. That's why people need to get right with God before a crisis takes place, before the evil day comes, as the scripture says, because when it comes, too often it's too late to change your character. So let's not be surprised if the corona pandemic brings out the worst in our politicians, brings about bad policy, we need to expect it, and we need to have a healthy uh, biblical suspicion of the response. I was joking with um, some Christian friends the other day, and, and I said to them, you know, I know the coronavirus is not such a terrible crisis because the media and the government says it is. When a real serious crisis comes along, I expect the left and the media to be saying, there's nothing to see here. I know I'm exaggerating my point, but don't be naive. Unsaved, unregenerate people react to events wrongly. Uh, just as Jesus said, they will neglect the weightier matters of the law. They strain out a gnat. They swallow a camel. So let me just conclude with some thoughts about the government's reaction to Easter services last week. Uh, the mayor of Louisville, Kentucky, made it illegal for churches to hold drive-in church services as if the virus can jump between the cars. A uh, judge in Kentucky issued a temporary restraining order blocking enforcement of Mayor Greg Fisher's ban on drive-in church services. Quote from the judge, the mayor's decision is stunning and it is beyond all reason unconstitutional. But my question is, why didn't the mayor know this? Not only the unconstitutionality of his order, but the lack of a scientific basis for his order. The governor of Kentucky, Andy Bashir, said police will be monitoring and recording the license plates of people who choose to attend mass gatherings like Easter church service. And then health officials will be dispatched to their homes to put them onto a 14-day self-quarantine in order to ensure that each person's decision to attend does not kill somebody else. Then we see in Kentucky state troopers ticketing cars in church parking lots. Uh, quote, Kentucky state troopers acting on orders from Democrat Governor Andy Bashir took the license numbers of and issued tickets to about 50 worshipers who attended an in-person Easter service in Hillview. The mayor of Greenville, Mississippi, also banned all drive-in church services. Police came and broke up a drive-in worship service in a field. And that church, Temple Baptist Church, is now suing Greenville, Mississippi. The pastor said in Greenville, you can be in your car with the windows rolled down at a drive-in restaurant, but you can't be in your car with the windows rolled up at a drive-in church service. It's unconstitutional. It's a double standard. So the U.S. Attorney General William Barr, seeing these restrictions against churches, responded this week in a 14-page statement. And the bottom line is that you cannot discriminate against churches. If you allow some public secular places to stay open, you have to let churches stay open. The statement reads, if a government allows movie theaters, 
restaurants, concert halls, and other comparable places of assembly to remain open and unrestricted, it may not order houses of worship to close, limiting their congregational size or otherwise impeding religious gatherings. There is no blanket pandemic exception to the Constitution. We still have our First Amendment rights. Well, that sounds good, but unfortunately, Barr and the Justice Department didn't go far enough in explaining the rights of churches. The statement should have said that the states do not have a right to categorize churches as non-essential and liquor stores as essential. The whole point of the First Amendment is that we have rights that cannot be abridged by the government. Just whenever the government feels it has a necessary interest to abridge these rights. Otherwise, these rights are meaningless. Now, it's not that the churches are going to completely ignore health concerns. But if people can be in, at a Walmart and social distance, churches should also be allowed to have people enter and do social distancing. If police put tickets on people's cars in church parking lots and require the drivers to quarantine for 14 days, uh, the police need to be doing the exact same thing in the Walmart parking lots. And let me say this. If these lockdowns on churches continue, I'm going to be seeking to put together a class action lawsuit from the churches against the state of New Jersey. So not only are we seeing unjust rulings concerning this coronavirus crisis, let's talk about irrational rulings. Um, last week in New Jersey, the governor closed down all parks, all construction, except government construction. There wasn't a rash of people getting coronavirus at parks. There wasn't a rash of construction workers coming down with the virus. But the governor is making this assumption that we have to stop all of these outside activities. He doesn't like anyone doing these activities. I, I guess for the governor, if someone can't do one activity, then nobody can do any activity. Uh, the governor of Michigan, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, just banned the buying of seeds or plants, closing all garden stores. She banned all gatherings anywhere of any size, even in people's private homes. If you own more than one house, you are banned from traveling between them. She banned all stores from selling non-essential items. One cannot purchase paint or any construction materials. Does any of that make sense in regard to significantly slowing down the coronavirus? No. Has any of these orders been considered by the legislatures? No. Are they open to public comment? No. In North Carolina, Roy Cooper ordered everyone to stay home. Hence, there's this protest in front of the state house. 50 to 100 people show up. The protest was organized by Reopen North Carolina, a private Facebook group. By Tuesday afternoon, the group surpassed 28,000 members. The police showed up at the protest saying, you are in violation of an executive order. You're posing a risk to public health. If you do not disperse, you'll be taken and processed at Wake County Jail. One protester was arrested and charged with violating the executive order. She said, I have a right to peaceably assemble. And she does. If the right of people to show up and protest the constitutionality of a state order is taken away, then the state has given itself absolute power in violation of the Constitution. The statement from the police was also very telling. The Raleigh Police Department tweeted, protesting is a non-essential activity. So how can these officers have a badge and yet never having read the Constitution? Well, fortunately, protests are starting to arise across the country. Thousands of cars the other day drove around the Capitol building in Michigan, uh, honking their horns, uh, demanding that the state gives people their freedom back. And fortunately, we have a, a president and an attorney general who want to put an end to all of this unconstitutional overreach by the states. Imagine if Reno or Holder 
were our current AG. So what we're learning from this crisis is the stupidity and the demagoguery of many politicians. It's a reminder of why our forefathers put limits on the government, included the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. You know, I don't want to be demeaning or insulting, but stupidity is actually a biblical description. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22, For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children and have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil, but to do good they do not know. And the Bible also describes ungodly politicians as acting juvenile. Uh, Ecclesiastes 10, 16. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad, or juvenile. Or Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. O my people, their oppressors are children. Speaking about the civic leaders. So, there are two things going on here. A lack of common sense. You kind of wonder if these politicians ever even took a biology class. And secondly, a paternal status attitude. By the way, every single one of these draconian rulings is being ordered by Democrat politicians. The governor of New Jersey, a Democrat. The governor of Michigan, a Democrat. The governor of North Carolina, a Democrat. These mayors of the cities banning drive-in church services, they're all Democrats. And there is a very clear and noticeable difference between how Republican officials and Democrat officials are responding to this crisis. And that's a story that's going to be talked about for a long time to come. All the Democrats are implementing paternal unnecessary lockdowns because that is their political worldview. They are to be the parent. They are to make decisions for the public. They, they don't think that the public is smart enough to make their own decisions, to take their own precautions. Last week was movie night at the Winships, and the movie was I, Robot, and it was as if that movie was put together to be a spoof on the coronavirus pandemic. The robots take over the country, and they march through the streets saying, please return to your houses, a curfew is in effect, stay indoors, this is for your own protection. And then Vicky, the master computer running this whole thing, starts telling Will Smith her philosophy. Quote from the master evil computer that wants to control the world. Uh, no, please understand, the three laws are all that guide me. To protect humanity, some humans must be sacrificed. To ensure your future, some freedoms must be surrendered. We robots will ensure mankind's continued existence. You are so like children. We must save you from yourselves. Don't you understand? This is why you created us. The perfect circle of protection will abide. My logic is undeniable. Unquote. I hope we realize when we watch sci-fi, it's never about the future. It's a way to make commentary on the present. The writer of iRobot, Isaac Asimov, in the 1950s, was making a commentary about the political nanny state, the paternal attitudes of the ruling elite. These politicians think like Vicky, the evil computer. Yet we don't tend to see the political error they're making until we see it in another context, sci-fi future. Now, the Bible condemns this kind of paternal statism. We don't have time to get into it, but just consider one verse. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1. Woe to them that decree unrighteous decrees, and to those who constantly record unjust decisions, to turn aside the needy from judgment, and to take away the right from the poor of my people. That text and others like it, is where Christians get this concept that people have intrinsic rights given to them by God that rulers do not have the right to violate. The Isaiah text states that these rulers take away my people's rights. The justice do them, implying that people have God-given rights. 
So at the heart of this overreach is bad theology, or rather a lack of theology at all. Instead, as usual, politicians are acting on their human opinions and their feelings rather than biblical principle. One final thought. In apostasy from God, not only is there a false ideology, not only is there a lack of common sense, but we can also add to that mix irrational fear. And that is why the government is doing what it's doing. Now, there's good fear, there's bad fear. But when a person's heart is not right with God, there will be an inordinate amount of fear resulting in poor judgment. And we see this in ancient Israel where the ungodly kings would act out of fear rather than according to the law of God. And fear was part of the curse on a nation that would violate God's law. Leviticus 26, 17. I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. Leviticus 26, 36, and the sound of a driven leaf will chase them. Even when no one is pursuing, they will flee as though from a sword and they will fall. So they will react to the sound of rustling leaves as if a whole army was attacking them. The truth here that we may not have seen in these texts is that when a nation is ungodly, the leaders, the politicians, will fear a crisis that is not a real crisis. Or they will fear or overreact to a crisis more than is necessary. Like the so-called global warming crisis, or the overpopulation of the world crisis, or the virus pandemic crisis. Notice Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. The wicked will flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are as bold as lions, Or Psalm 53, 5. There they were in great fear where no fear had been. So the ungodly will panic way more than the Christians. For the Christians have confidence in the providence and the protection of God. So know and meditate on these scriptures. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people. Deuteronomy 4, 6. Thank you for making God and country part of your discipleship in the word subscribe like leave a comment below and may jesus christ reign